Now this surely must be the ultimate fishing platform with a seat as well. Okay guys, this is just about tips on shore fishing. There's plenty of boats out at sea there, they're all fishing, but when you come to fish from the shore, it's a whole different ball game. Whether it's rocks, beach, cliffs, whatever, there's always something working against you. And in this case, it was tidal situations. Exactly, I was down in the west country of Cornwall, which is the southwest corner of England, for those of our people abroad who watch our show. And the rise and fall in tide here is nothing huge. It's nothing huge, it just goes up and it goes down, but it's quite important with fishing, as you know, to get the right phase of tide for fishing. I was given completely duff information by the local tackle shop, and when I get down there, the tide was completely wrong. It changes approximately an hour every day. So when you're looking for shore marks, I would strongly suggest check the tide tables on your um, phone, your apps, your internet, your computer, whatever, and get down at low water and look for rock marks like this. As you can see, there's a nice rascally cutting back in the, uh, in the, in the ground there. If you move along, you can see there's a nice defined edge. I know it's deep, there's a boy out there with some uh, crab pots in it. Well, this area here must surely have been some sort of gun emplacement. But listen, one of those gunners must have been a fisherman because I can't see a way to get down to the rocks until I look at the back of the gun emplacement and look, a complete hidey hole archway to crawl through just big enough to pass your rods through and that, believe it or not, will give you access, I believe, down there to get down the rocks and that's where I want to fish. Is that convenient or what? People, I've got my baits out, but I've given some duff information. The, well, there's got to be about three hours out with the tidal situation, and I've got, when I turned up, all rigged up, there's about another hour and a half of falling tide to go. So I've got the absolute dead tide at the bottom, and <laughs> dead tide is the word, dead, nothing there. So I've got up here, I've got four baits out. I've, I've, I've done a bit of spinning, but I've talked to another guy who was spinning here as well. He came down in the dawn this morning. First light, he had a couple of mackerel, not, nothing great. He's been back here when I've been there. It's now 3.30 in the afternoon. He's gone again because he's dead. The wind's coming up. If it's not, I'm going to salvage that situation and go down to uh, Mylon Marina, try and get some mini species. So if you're struggling, if you get things wrong, listen, we all get things wrong. If you get things wrong, check tides, check tides, check wind, because the wind can affect the tide as well. And then think, how can I change? Now I've already moved once to find some clean ground, so I've learned something. Now the wind's coming up, I probably won't be able to cast as far as I want to cast to get over the snags. So I'll give it another hour and a half, and they're gonna truck on down the road, further up into the estuary, out of the wind, and smaller mini species, see if we can get something out of this. And you can find baits at low water as well. Here are some mussels. Just clinging to the rocks, they're usually easy to get off. And also you're going to find limpets. Now this also tells you that it's going to be covered by seawater, so take care. And one way of getting those limpets off or getting up the uh, bigger mussels, just a sharp knife and you just rest the point, just touching the shell. Don't tap the shell because they do know when there's any vibration and they'll suck down so hard. Well, I've even snapped the point of a knife sometimes trying to get them off. You've got to do it first time round. Rest the point of the knife there, put the heel of your other hand and just bump it so it goes straight under the shell. Very often they just fly off. If not, just give the knife a little bit of a twist. Be very careful because obviously knives are sharp and you should collect enough, 10 or 20, 30, whatever you think you're going to need for a little bit of session and they cut up well for the mini species. Same goes for the mussels. They're much, much easier to get off. They're nowhere near as tough as those limpets. But, you know, a bait is a bait is a bait. And I've still got squid and mackerel, which I can use squid strips and pieces of mackerel as well. The downside is, in our little caravan where Mike went yesterday, he just left me one light tackle rod. Not good. I've got rods that throw 
four, five, six, and seven ounces here because I was hoping to catch something big on the uh, on the bottom fishing baits. Not so. Take care when walking over the rocks. It is all too easy to rush and have a fall. It's not what you want, especially fishing alone. Now this is how I pop off the limpets. Do it quickly to get them off. If you do this one slow, look, it's already sucked on there. It's already sucked on. I'll do enough, the next one to it, look, pop. So if you do it in one movement, generally you can get them off. You can use what we used to call an old butter knife. It's quite good, but you do need to get something under there. The minute they feel that vibration, they're going to suck on. Whereas the muscles here, you can normally just sort of twist or wrench them off. Just watch your fingers. You don't want to cut on the shell and you do not want to cut your fingers on the barnacles. But these are all baits that can be used. And of course, the fish are used to crunching these up. That's used to their, well, it's in their environment. Check out the rock pools. Very often you can take a dip net and I could see a small fish move in there actually. That's why I'm searching with the camera. You can get shrimps in there, so you might be able to catch them with a shrimp net. You get small live fish if you want live baits. Occasionally you'll see a little darting movement, that shrimp's darting around, I think, in there. Now here, when you're looking at a low water mark, it's a weed ground along the edge. A high water, you're gonna lose your gear in that. So at low water, you can see there's an edge to the right, which is deeper, and that's where you wanna to aim to be casting. You wanna be slightly away from the weed beds. Now, if you're new to rock fishing, just be aware of where the high and low water tide is. You might not know where the low water is. If it's falling down, you obviously can't see it as it's falling back. But high water, you can tell, and you don't want to get cut off anywhere, is by looking for things like barnacles, those limpets, mussels, anything that's a living sea organism or weed means it gets covered at high water. So just a little guide. Also be very, very careful when you're walking over the rocks. Different types of consistencies of the rocks and conditions, i.e. rain, can make it very, very slippery. A good gripping one are the ones covered in barnacles. It also tells you that the tide is going to cover them because the barnacle is a living organism. Very, very good for gripping on the shoes, but not so good if you fall over. And also a little tip, don't put your rod down on them too much. A tiny little nick on your line could mean not casting and busting off on the cast, fighting a fish in, and then it goes. That's even worse. Another tip, if you're fishing down and you think is low water, make a mental note in your mind of a mark or the weed, and then look back after 30 minutes, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, and if it's covered, you know it's starting to flood in. Fishing could get better, but again, if you've got to get back up on the headland, or on mainland, or out of a gully, be aware, don't get carried away with the fishing. Make sure you can always get back and don't get cut off. Once you've found some clean ground, distance is not really a necessity. It's keeping that bait over clean ground, because don't forget the fish will come in close where the deep water meets the kelp of the rock. When you go to retrieve, make sure you crank and wind as fast as you can to get that bait, the weight of the lead weight, and your bait up off the bottom, away from the snags, away from the weed. So get it in as quick as you can. And here I've got a whole lot back. So lob out a nice bait close in where that drop off is. You can see the difference between the light and the dark just out from the edge of the rock. And that's where you could get conger eels. Now here's a mistake. Number one, I caught a mackerel. I thought I'd drop it in that rock pool, set up the camera and then take it out. Uh, very bad move, Graham. A fresh big mackerel in a nice clear saltwater rock pool is not easy to net out. There you go. I mean, I could leave it in there until the uh, tide comes in, but eventually I managed to catch him and didn't want him for bait, didn't want him for tea. Again, looking at the rock top, just be aware that you might make a wrong footmark and then just slip on the rock. So what I do, retrieving, 
screw the drag up nice and tight, crank down really fast, wheel it and hit the rod to get the lead off the deck, get it away from the snakes and bring it in as fast as you can and that way you can generally get all your bait back and your rig but in this case look guys that was a whole squid and if you look carefully the head has been bitten off so yes even though I was at the wrong time there were fish about because the tide was starting to move here it comes thank goodness it saved the day only a dogfish but still a fish so it just goes to illustrate how important it is to get that tide right I'd waited the three hours, which was the three hour mistake the tackle shop guy gave me. I waited the three hours and then I started to get the odd bite. Check those tides, get them right, ask for local advice. Well, local angler advice, I suggest. And this one wasn't going to keep it, unhook it and put it back. After coming off the rocks in rain and wind, I mean, I got really cold. Don't get wet and stay out on the rocks, guys. It's not pleasant. A, it's dangerous, and B, really uncomfortable. I used to do this with a lot of camping this shore fishing. Now, yes, it's all chilled. I'm in the drifter. Not the high sea drifter of the boat. The drifter, the movie, the caravan. Okay, so I'm in the sanctuary of the caravan. The rain has finally stopped drumming on the windows. Um, I've got no floodlights, so I'm just gonna run through quickly. When you want to make a change from, let's say, heavy rock fishing like that, and you just want to salvage something out of the trip, you could be on a holiday, you could have travelled a long way. If you can adapt and change, you can always generally winkle something out there, catch some sort of fish, salvage the trip. You might like fishermen, save the blank. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go further up inside that Falmouth estuary. There's a stone, an old stone jetty up in there, but... No good at low water, it's got to be high water. Now this time, I've double checked the tides. I haven't listened to somebody else who tells me when they think the tide is high. That really screwed me up yesterday. Now I've got the high tide. I'm going to go down there, it's going to be rain, it's going to be grotty, I know it is. Got to get up early in the morning to catch the tide. It's only going to last maybe an hour and a half, two hours. You know, it comes up about an hour, sits, it goes out. Once that starts to disappear, the fish go off to feed. Anyway, two types of fish in there. Float fishing you can do, or the one that I catch a lot with is what I call just a straight, put the spectacles on, lead at the bottom, a paternoster or paternoster. Now, it's dead easy. Let's say, so for UK fishing, I know a lot of you guys around the world like catching small fish as well. I use it for bait fishing if I'm catching stuff for sharks and tarp, and it's a real good bait rig. Any, any form of lead on the bottom, okay? I'm going to say, measure that, it's normally half a metre from... Here to his, they reckon it's a yard, so that's, I suppose, well, it's a bit under that. Let's say 30 inches. Lead at the bottom, 15 pound line. Oh, that was loud. To a swivel, small swivel at the top, okay? So you've just got a length of line and a weight. You come through the rubber rings with a line, you come down, you tie it on here. But you're going to want somewhere to tie the hooks. Now just, this is the way I do it. You can use fancy blood loops if you want, blood droppers. I just take a loop, I want a hook about here, near the lead. Let's say two inches, I make a loop, I turn it around like this. Hoping you can see this in this caravan, it's a bit dark because it's rainy. And I make a loop about two inches. Now that gives me a four inch dropper. As you can see that loop there. Hopefully you can see the loop. Now what I'm going to do, you want to get yourself a pair of these snippers on the website. They're really handy, fold up, and they're so easy. Go in your pocket, snip, snip, I love it. Just snip, doesn't matter whether you go top or bottom. Just one, watch, ready, pop. Now that then stands off as a single hook link. You can even make it a little bit shorter. Then let's say about 15 inches off the bottom, I make a second loop. You can go through twice if you want, if you're gonna catch big fish. This is for a small fish rig. A double overhand surgeon's loop is in our how to tie knot section. It's on the playlist, snip it. So as you can see, you've got two tag ends there. Now just offer it up, just roughly. You can make these really quick, that's what I like about it. I work a lot quicker when I'm fishing. I say they're a little bit too long. I want them quite short so that they don't twist around the main line. So let's go for, I'm gonna say three inches. They're so handy, these snippers. Three inches, I'm gonna tie the hook on, he says hopefully, because he hasn't got his reading glasses on. These are a hook called a sea prince, but the main thing is that people make a big mistake with is they use hooks that are too big. Right, 
again, little tag in, just nip it off. I'm not going to tie both hooks, you obviously got the gist of it. Now if you look there, they are, because I've kept it short, it doesn't tangle around the main stem of the line. So I'm going to have two hooks, one there, and this one will be about here. Snip the tag end off, snip, snip with my little snippers, job done. Bait that with tiny, weeny, tiny pieces of squid, mackerel, limpets like I took off the rocks there, pieces of limpets. Now then, this is for a fairly big fish. You could land a 10 or 20 pound fish on that with a small hook. That's quite, I've done it because I use a sea prince hook because it's thick and you can see it in the camera. The big thing to do is to use a really small bait hook. I used to use these in Florida a lot. They are very, very long shank. And I always say to them, maybe it's a size 10 freshwater hook or perhaps even a size eight. Why do you have such a long shank? And they told me because you can get hold of the shank of the hook, unhook the fish because they're using it for bait, throw them in the live well, get straight back out again. You haven't got to fiddle around with the scorgers. So a long shanked hook. It's like a fine wire Aberdeen, but it's not too fine, I have to say. Okay, that's that rig. Now down to the float rig. Now there's a variety of floats you can use. Obviously, the float suspends the bait at a predetermined depth and you put it at whatever depth you want. That one there is just a freshwater bodied Avon float. You can have a float rubber at the top and a little ring at the bottom. So you thread the line from your reel through the rubber, down through the bottom and it's fixed like that. I'm not gonna bother. What I'm gonna do is just go through there twice. Now, a larger float means a larger weight, which means you can cast a bigger distance. Not necessarily for suspending a bigger bait. That's something that people make a mistake with. They think big float. Big bait. Well, I've got a big float, guys. I really have got a big float. This thing you could kill people with. You actually could. That thing is a monster. That's for a sliding float in deep water with a monumental lead, heaving it out probably 60 yards. I rarely, rarely use that one, to be honest. This is close in, fishing around docks, keys, piers. You want something small, sensitive, just enough to suspend a bait. This is a different type of float. It has a rubber at the top, a rubber at the bottom. You slide the rubber off here, okay? Thread the line through the rubber, back on the top. Line comes down here, take the bottom one off, thread the rubber through the bottom, slide it back on. Now the line is pinched there on that, and that float is set at that depth, but you can slide it up and down. The downside is if you cast hard, it will slip under the rubbers. So you almost need to tie, say, elasticated thread around it to suspend it and keep it nice and tight. But one I do like using is this. Now this is called a self-cocking or self-writing float because it already has an integral piece of weight in there. So you don't have to put any weight on it. It's idiot proof. You just thread your line through here, two little locking shot either side, and that sits like this in the water and it casts pretty well like a bullet. Maybe you've got to pay a little bit more for them because they're a self-writing float, but trust me, a lot easier, especially for youngsters. So here's the basic rig up. Okay, now here's the basic rig for that sliding float with the self-writing weight in the bottom of it. I've got it locked either side. This is your reel line to come down from the rod top. I have a shot here, so say a BB shot. It goes through the eye of the float. Another shot there, let's pinch that up. And of course, as we all know, there's one thing good for pinching teeth and good for dentist spills. Ow. There we go. So that's locked. So it's going to come down like this and it's going to settle there. Now, if you want to put extra weight on to bring it down, you could put a shot about a foot from the bait here. So that is a fixed method. It's pinched at that depth. It's up to you to set the depth you want. You might put it at, say, I would reckon four to eight feet. It's a length of the rod. This is for using basically the length of the average fishing rod because otherwise the line's going to be all over the floor, the bait, the float's going to be at the top. You won't be able to cast it properly. So this is a fixed float method, okay? You can see it, it spins around there, but you can also shot it down a little bit low if you want. Just to show you the size of bait I would be using on this, I've put a piece of paper because squid, mackerel, and any other form of bait is banned inside the drifter caravan. Wifey would not like squid found in drawers, cupboards, anywhere like that, and I leave it anyway. So there's the hook. I just hook it once like this, say a piece of squid or a piece of mackerel skin, 
and come out once there to hold it straight. It just holds it straight, just over the top. That's all you want. A big thing, people make a mistake, is they put too big a piece of bait on. You want a small piece of bait, and you want it long and thin, so it looks like a small fish or a small sandal. So there's the float, the float set like this, and way back here, sinking down like this, is your bait. Okay, that's a fixed one. Now, should you, you can do the same with this one as well. Say top and bottom, or bottom end only, pinch it either side. Should you be, let's say you want to fish 12 or 15 feet deep, and you don't have a long rod, then you will have to use the sliding float. And I'll show you how this one works. Right, guys, here we go. This is the sliding float method with the head cracker float. It's a monster, this one, for sure. Right, line comes through the rod top comes down to the float. Now, this slides up and down. As you can see, there's a hole here, a tube right through the middle of the float. There's loads of these sliding floats you can get, and they are called a sliding float because they slide up and down. You cast out the weight and the bait pulls down through the float, but hang on, it's just gonna keep pulling and pulling till it snags on the bottom, isn't it? So you need something at the top to fix it so that when the float fly, floats up through the water, it goes bump, it comes up against something that stops it, and it sinks down and sits in the water like that. Now, because they have such a large diameter, because they can take quite a big, big line, big diameter line, you can't just put a stop knot here or any form of uh, whipping, you know, to, to jam up because it's going to pop through the hole there. So make sure you put a bead there, just a sliding bead like that, just the standard method of doing it. So you can imagine it's going to look like that. It's going to be bead, float, and then weight. Right. Now, this is going to slide up. Let's say I set that from the bait to the top of my rod if I've got a long rod and a fish are about 12 feet deep. I've got to put a stop knot here at 12 feet deep. Now, you can either do a stop knot or you can use, we've got this again, it's on our website, elasticated thread. It's bait elastic, basically, very fine shearing elastic. I snap some off, I just double it, I just pinch it, you see. Here's my real line coming down like this. And I just wind it around and around and around. All you're doing is making a knot. It's just sort of a quite easy. And I'll tell you another one that's good is just a regular rubber band. That can be good as well. Just a small rubber band. You just tie a couple of knots, whip it around the line so it grips the line. But you can also slide it with your nail. I'll show you in a minute. Whip it up tight like this. And that is enough of a thickness to stop that bead sliding over it. And the bead in turn stops the sliding float going over it. Okay, so I've tied you. I've actually taken the trouble to tie two on there. There is my bait elastic. And I've left a little tag end sticking up there so you can see. Once you cast out, the weight pulls everything through the middle of the float. The bead comes up against, just here, up against that. And it will set as a float. Cocks itself there with the weight pulling down. And if you just wet either side of this, Get your nail, if you want to shallow it, or make it deeper, if you get your nail, look, look, it slides down, you can actually alter the depth. The traditional way is to use a stop knot there, I've actually tied a stop knot, hopefully you can see that there guys. A stop knot, which is tighter on the line, but again, just wet either side of it, get your nail, and you can slide it up and down. So both of those methods, I'll slide them both up together, and you can see them together then. Both of those knots stop the bead there, which in turn, supports the float. So, I'm gonna run through it again. Those at the back, Smith, Smith, you at the back there. Take notice. There's my real line, it comes down. It goes with a bead, through the bead, through the float, right down here. Now, you need a weight, which is generally a drill bullet, to cock the float, to set the float like this. And you can either go straight through to a hook, or you can put a swivel, which is traditional way, most people do it, a barrel, small barrel swivel there, so the weight slides up against the barrel swivel like this. Weight sits on the barrel swivel. Just supported just there, there's the swivel. And then you can use a lighter hook link coming down of however long you want. Now I've tied this short just for the sake of the camera. Let's say three or four feet, two feet even. That could be say 15 pound line. So you can have heavy reel line, 30 pound line, down to this swivel from there onwards, just going on here to the hook bait, lighter, let's say 15 pounds. Hopefully, guys, you got that it's for deep water fishing. I won't be using this tomorrow on the key because it's shallow. It's probably only eight feet deep at most, and I'll probably be fishing about mid-water, I guess, four, three or four feet. So that's a sliding float there. As you can see, works perfectly. Well, there you go. Let's hope there's two or three different ways of rigging floats up there that might catch you a few extra fish 
I'm certainly going to try it down on that key. The weather, that's not great, guys, I have to tell you. Good job I've got the caravan. I'm going to go down there early in the morning. I'm going to get that tide at 7 o'clock. I'm pretty sure the fish will be there. Let's get down there and see if the totally awesome floats work and see if we are a cut above the rest. Guys, what I've done is move from that rock mark, come back to stone jetty, like a key, and I'll be using sliding float. This one's just a bodied Avon freshwater float, a swan shot for weight, and a strip of mackerel. It's a bit mushy, but you can use squid as well. Let's get that wrap right around. You don't want it too long. And I've got up early, hopefully, there's gonna be some mackerel and smaller species moving up inside here inside this key so what you do is I'll just mash up some mackerel just chop up a little bit of mackerel I've got some soft mackerel from a day or two ago I'm going to use it off those rocks and do you know what I think it's better used as chum as an attractant and mackerel eat mackerel they're definitely cannibal so I'm going to chum some up first and see if that will bring the mackerel around and I'll probably just use my beach rods I'm totally out of sync here and I've got heavy tackle with small hooks and just see if there's anything else small on the bottom as well. It's one of those salvage something sort of trips. Now this one, this one's slightly different. This is a sliding float. I've gone through the bottom eye twice to lock it because I'm only shallow, but it's a self-cocking float. So there's all weight. You can see that brass weight in here. That'll set it down. So the rest of this is free lining down to a piece of mackerel meat on the hook. Get it out there, see what's see what's about in the early morning. If you put the rod down, always put the drag, just back it off a little bit. And the tide is still flooding in. I can see by the float. I've already missed one bite by talking to you folks on the camera. I've got an expendable lead gel on the bottom, just pad and ostered two small hooks about size 10 long shank freshwater hooks going to drop that down the bottom just down the side just see if there's any real tiny little fish down there that's going to save me a blank The first fish I've got out here is a garfi on the surface, which is great fun on light tackle, but I'm on a beach rod. Here we go. See, now that was worth, that was worth getting out of bed for, wasn't it? As we say, it's got slime all over the lens, and like all good garfish, yes, it swallowed the hook. So there you go, garfish. Totally awesome little scrapper. Let's get it back in the water and look for something else. Hope he doesn't flip out my hands. Hold him by the tail. A scad. Just a small scad. It'd be absolutely superb bait for a uh, for a bass. Looks like something's had a go in there anyway. So two different species. <laughs> the rod down I've got to show you. It's absolutely it's rattling away there. See if I can get it zoomed in for you. You want you to stop biting now. There he is. Look, 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 look. Fish rattling away on that limpet. Now it's one down the side and two float out further out. So it could be a third species on there. That is some bite. Well, we're in again, guys. There's the scad. So they're on the bite. Unfortunately, the rain's coming. So we're going to have to drop the camera out of the way. See what's on this bottom line. That looks like just another small scad there. So, I'm on fire at the moment. I'm soon going to get put out with all the rain. Guys, here we go. 
got a mackerel there on the float. I had a few other bites. Be really need to be on the ball. I'm gonna hold this one's tail because I don't want him splashing all over the lens there. He's absolutely mullered it. If you don't want to keep him for bait, if you don't want to keep him for eating, just put them back. I've actually got a second one on this one. the size of this one lady. Oh, it's got that is like a little miniature tuna, isn't it? Eh? Great fish to catch, great on light tackle. Good job by moving that rock mark. Come down here on the stone key. Get the tides right this time. And I've got the tides right. Several fish. And once you've had one or two fish, you want to keep that chum going in. There's no question that'll keep the shoulder around you as long as the tide flows there, you should be able to keep them in front of you and chum them into a tighter ball. So guys, you can see, by continually working at float fishing, you can get some really good fish. And here come yet another garfish. Now as a tip, garfish will generally come right on the surface layer, so you can afford to fish quite shallow for them. The mackerel can be on the surface, but are more likely to be, I'm saying, three to four or five feet down. Provided you rotate, you can change from one species to the other. And once they find that chum that I was chopping up and throwing in, Generally, and this is a generalization, they will stay with you. Even the small fish, two at a time, scad this time. So thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Don't forget to watch the Totally Awesome Outdoor Show. And of course, get your copy, free to download of the Awesome Angler. I think that one's a smelt, I'm not sure. It's another species. <laughs>